This video is brought to you by my generous backers over on Patreon. If you'd like to support the channel and get cool perks like access to the Discord, seeing the videos a week before anyone else, or exclusive Patreon-only gameplays, then feel free to check out my Patreon. The link's in the description below. Tuvasa the Sunlit versus Wasitora Nikoru Queen, Golos Tireless Pilgrim, and Rien Angel of Rebirth. Uh, not the best hand, but yeah, I can hope for a, a land we draw on the first turn in multiplayer. And we've got the Fertile Ground, so we can go for that on Savannah. Alright, already we're on a turn one play. Home Doggy, a patron of the channel. Playing Rihanna, and that is a Wild Cantor, which is a human druid. Sacrifice it, one mana of any colour, so 1-1. One, one. Then a tap land from Go Go Batman, another patron, playing Golos, Tireless Pilgrim. And then Low Becker is a Magic Online Random, just going for a tap land. Alright, and already we get into another coloured source, so we can go for the Fertile Ground onto the Sun Petal Grove. Uh, that'll give us our blue mana. Another play on turn two by home, going for Evolutionary Leap. That's a really good one. Yeah, really like that. Then the other two players just going for a land and pass. We are going to play... Yeah, let's play Strip Mine. We can use that as a Rattlesnake effect so that people are less likely to point removal at us with Tuvasa. Or less likely to point removal at Tuvasa, I should say. So we'll get down our commander, the first commander of the game entering. And then we just need to hope that she survives until next turn so that we can actually get some card draw going with her. Probably just go for greater Auromancy. Just a land from the two patrons and then the Wasi Tora player going for a crack on the Myriad Landscape. Alright, and we get into another coloured source there, that's good. So let's go for that and we'll get ourselves a blue. I'd really like to get down the Eidolon of Blossoms so that we draw even more cards off of these enchantments, but I don't want both of my enchantresses getting wrapped up in a board wipe. And there we go, there's already some removal, so Swords to Plowshares goes on to two Vassa. We'll still get the card draw. And there's a Dark Steel Mutation. So at that point, I don't really feel like playing out anything else then if we don't have an enchantress to go with it. Need to decide in the meantime whether we want to go for the Archon or the Eidolon of Blossoms Enchantress. We've got quite a few cards in hand, so I might try and get a board state going with the Archon. A Hero of Precinct 1. Whenever you cast a multicoloured spell, you get a human token. And then one damage going in at Gogo. -Go. Then Gogo, -Go, just playing a Maze of Ith. I think I'd rather save the Strip Mine for the inevitable Field of the Dead, to be honest. But we might have to shoot the Maze of Ith. Then Wasi Tora playing Xenagos, God of Revels. That's a scary one. That gives... Uh, where is it? Gains Haste and plus X plus X. It doesn't gain Trample. Yeah, I always think it gives Trample, but it is just Haste. Alright, uh, we have Wolf Willow Haven. Uh, let's go for the Archon of Sun's Grace. We've got two, three, four... Yeah, as much as I'd like to draw a card off of Wolf Willow Haven, we'll get out the Wolf Willow Haven first. Because we're not making a land this turn. Then we'll go for the Archon of Sun's Grace. That is Flying and Lifelink, a 3-4. And every time an enchantment enters under our control, we get a 2-2 Pegasus with flying. And those tokens will have Lifelink as well, as long as this stays in play. Really good new Enchantress card from Theros Beyond Death. Knight of New Alara for home. Each other multicoloured creature you control gets plus one plus one for each of its colours. I imagine we'll see some Alara cards in this uh, in this deck, seeing as how it cares about multicolour. And now going after the Wasi Tora player and spreading the damage going on to Gogo -Go as well. They maze on this thing. And Gogo -Go playing a tap land, the desert of the indomitable. And then just deciding to pass over again. Doing pretty well considering he's a Golos player and hasn't done anything 
other than play land so far. But we're up to a pretty slow start thus far. Ah, oh, haven't played against Nick's Lotus yet. I'll be very intrigued to see how that does. It'll develop at least one colour at the moment. Yeah, let's just go in for the Eidolon of Blossoms, actually. My favourite Enchantress card is Eidolon of Blossoms because it triggers off of itself entering. And then it's an enchantment as well, so it triggers other Enchantress effects, such as the Archon of Sun's Grace. So we'll get a Pegasus token, and we'll draw a card. Then we'll go for Seal of Cleansing as well, and we'll see if I can make my opponent tap down the Maze of Ith. Okay, we're getting to another Enchantress, that's good, so if someone wipes the board, we've still got means of drawing cards. We'll go in at Go Go, and just deciding to take it by the looks of it, so we'll gain a little bit of life there, go up to 44. I think we are looking like the biggest threat at the moment, but you've got to think of what Golos can do in the late game. A 1-1 going in at Wasitora. 2-2 going in at the same player, and then we've got a 3-3 coming in at us. Uh, I think I would rather just keep the tokens, to be honest. Although it is one less mana for them, which could hurt. Yeah, we only lose one token. Let's go like this. We'll gain life there as well. We'll gain four life. All right, now that's interesting. Maze of Ith is being used on the Wild Cantor, so no life will be gained there and no creatures will die. Just three damage over here. And then a Life's Legacy. Sacrificing the 3-3, three, three, so that is gain three and draw three, I think. Oh, you just draw cards, you don't gain any life. So draw three there and they go straight in for a Swift Foot Boots. Go, go, playing a Gateway Plaza and paying the mana for that. That will tap for any colour, but you've got to put mana into it when it enters. And now it is a Nyctho Shrine to Nyx as well. There's the potential for a lot of mana being made here. Okay, the Devotion's spread out pretty thin at the moment though. Although that does switch off tutors, switches off fetches as well, of which we have a few in the deck. And it's an 8-8 with... Haste and Flying. Doesn't have Trample, does it? Oh, it does have Trample. Alright, so that gets through our Pegasus creatures. But deciding not to swing in. Uh, we've got Leyline of Anticipation now. Which could be useful, so... I think we go for that, and that will be a means of us getting out our Commander quite comfortably as well. So we'll go for the Leyline. This will get us a Pegasus, and draw us a card again. And then we get into another land for the turn, that's good, we can keep making lands. Uh, so, do we want to play anything else? I don't think so. No, we'll just leave it there. I'm going to swing in at Go Go with these two creatures, because there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of damage getting through over there, so... If we're struggling this early in the game, then... I think we're certainly going to be struggling later on. So I'm not necessarily going to try and knock them out of the game immediately, but if their life total is teetering quite low in the teens or around the 10 mark, then I'm much happier that a goal loss player is there. It's better than the being at 30 anyway. But I'm very conscious of this Wasi Tora player as well. They seem to be playing some good stuff. Ooh, cracking and Arid Mesa is home doggy, forgetting all about the 10 life that Obnixilis will deal to them. I think they get counters as well. Oh no, they get a plus counter whenever another creature dies. Oh, they have to sacrifice a creature and lose 10 life. That's the other clause. So they just sacked a token there, I think. Then playing a Tome of the Guild Pack. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, draw a card and add one mana of any color. Then the Boots goes on to the Knight of Nualara. And they're just passing the turn at that. And there he is, Golos Tireless Pilgrim coming down. And let's see what land they go for. Our strip mine being on the field may well slow them down on whatever their plan is with the lands here, oh, of course, but forgetting all about Obnixilis again. I must admit, I'm forgetting about Obnixilis myself, so a lot of damage being dealt by that thing already. And they have to sacrifice their Golos. Maybe that was on purpose. They get to search for a land. And then replay Golos next turn, although they'll take 10 again, so 
I can't see it being on purpose. They went for Cascading Cataracts anyway. A means of getting Wooberg off of five colourless. So both of the patrons down to the twenties already. Ooh, Nyx Bloom Ancient. Triple mana. Uh, yeah, I mean that has Grasp of Fate written all over it. So I think... We need to think about whether we want to go for Sator Enchanter first or not. Our oh, commander's going to cost five. All right, there's a Blood Artist as well. We could just leave this in play and leave Wasi Tora as a huge target. But does anyone have a means of actually dealing with Wasi Tora's stuff is the question. All right, they decide to double up the power of the 0-1 Blood Artist. So obviously they're not planning on swinging in. It's noteworthy though that they now have Devotion to Green of 4 and this triggers on tapping any permanent for mana so this will tap for 8 now and yeah I think that definitely means that we need to get rid of the Nyx Bloom Ancient so I think we'll go just to try and draw as many cards as possible we'll go for the Sator Enchanter oh Sigil of the Empty Throne is really good as well uh, wow, how much mana are we going to have then? That's 2, 4, 6 and 8. Might draw into another land. That means we can go Sigil of the Empty Throne and Stasis Snare. Yeah, let's do that. Sigil of the Empty Throne comes down, we draw two cards. Estrid's Invocation is really good, especially if it's got Flash. Uh, draw a couple of cards, get a Pegasus token. And we do not get into a land, but I am going to hold off with the Stasis Snare. So I think I will swing in at Home Doggy there. And then all of these can go in at the Wasi Tora player. They can only block one of them, but we'll gain life at least. Okay, so Obnixilis is blocking one of the Pegasus tokens, so that will go down, but we'll gain... 6 life from the tokens, and then 9 in total, thanks to the Archon. And then, I guess we'll get Drain for 1, depending on where the Blood Artist is pointed. And a plus counter goes on Obnixilis as well, from the token Dain. And yeah, the Blood Artist is pointed at us. So we'll leave it at that. We can surprise our opponents with an Angel token, thanks to Sigil of the Empty Throne. And we can go for, I mean, anything we want here. We can go Stasis Snare, um, Dark Steel Mutation, Imprisoned in the Moon. Got a lot of answers going at the moment. Now a Xenoghost is coming down. Xenoghost the Reveler. That will get them into a token and it will draw them a card. With the Tome of the Guild Pact. And they're going to gain a nice chunk of mana here because they've got three creatures in play. Could go in for their commander. And it could have haste with the Swiftfoot Boots. Looks as though that's exactly what they're going for. And they're getting some nice value from their stuff here. Really liking the Tome of the Guild Pact. And assuming there's no Trample in play. These coming down as Chump Blockers isn't bad either. So the Angel Lord enters. She is an 8-7. And she is going to have haste and hexproof as well. So do we want to go for Grasp of Fate? Does that get around... No, it's targeting. Some of these things get around targeting, but... No, we won't be able to get rid of anything from the Golos player is the problem. Yeah, it doesn't have Trample. I'm just going to leave it be and hope that they help us out. Getting rid of, well, either one of these players. But I think they're just going to leave it back, to be honest. Because we're looking like we're quite threatening at the moment. Yep, just leaving it back. Now, depending on what Golgo -Go aims for here, we might be able to go for Grasp of Fate instead of the Stasis Snare. Ooh, and all is dust. Wow. Dark Steel Mutation doesn't make it colourless, does it? I've looked at this a million times for this exact reason. No. If it turned it into a colourless artifact, we could save our Archon of Sun's Grace here. All is dust, that's a really good one. Yeah, I mean, I don't see that there's anything we can really do. We go down quite a bit of mana as well. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Could get down our two Vassar again. Well, I'm definitely going to sacrifice the Seal of Cleansing. 
Uh, we'll get rid of the Tome, because that's card draw. This isn't anywhere near as frightening when triple mana and devotion is gone. Yeah, I think that's pretty much all we want to do. That all is dust really hurts. So at the moment, we need to think if we want to go for Eternal Witness onto the Ley Line of Anticipation, or onto the Sigil of the Empty Throne, or if we just want to try and build up a board state with Tuvasa again. Anyway, a bunch of Blood Artist triggers going on the stack, and it looks as though they're all going on to Go-Go, as punishment for playing the All is Dust. And then Abnixilis would get some counters, but it's obviously not in play. Rien is whenever another multicoloured creature you control dies, return it to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. Alright, so what is that for them? Uh, they will get back the Knight of New Alara, and I think that's the only multicoloured creature they had. So go, go, going down to eight, and can't say I mind that after the All is Dust. Yeah, if we get into a land, I think we can go Eternal Witness into the Ley Line again. And then maybe hold up all our mana for a Tuvasa the turn after. It's really slow, but if we can have the Ley Line out for the rest of the game, it really helps us. And that all is dust might be playing into the Jund player's hand here, because I dare say they've got a lot of haste in the deck. Wasi Tora comes down anyway. Followed by a Dark Steel Plate, which cannot be equipped, but it's not likely to get destroyed anyway. Okay, so no land for us. So in that case, maybe we just go to Vasa. And we'll just hold up the Strip Mine. And see if we can hurt anyone with that. A Vidalcan Orrery. Yeah, that is pretty much a Ley Line of Anticipation, but it's an artifact. I've already shown how good that effect can be in a game of Commander. Now from Golos, Honden of Life's Web, that is a shrine. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a spirit for each shrine you control. So I dare say they've got more than the one shrine in the deck. Then just tapping out and passing. Just trying to think about my next turn, and I think it depends on where the Wasi Tora player swings in. They will probably swing in at us because we're at 55. But depending on how much damage they deal to us, I might go in for Dark Steel Mutation onto that next turn, or Imprisoned in the Moon. Gaia's Blessing, that shuffles it back in and draws cards, so they're getting the Xenagos, Obnixilis, and the Nyx Bloom Ancient back into the library. And an Exquisite Blood. Wow, so they're going to start gaining a lot of life themselves. They'll actually get to way more life than we've got within a few turns if that sticks around. Oh, Lightning Greaves, yep, yeah. I was talking about haste. Something you'll often see in a Jun deck, but it's arguable that Lightning Greaves goes in pretty much every commander deck. Especially ones that run creatures, so that switches off our removal then. Although we can still go for Grasp of Fate at least. And, okay, goes in at Golos. So Wasi Tora is going to get a 3-3 creature and gain 5 life here. So all we need to do is play three enchantments and strip mine the Maze of Ith, and we can get rid of Golos, but that only puts us on very few mana, and we are not drawing into many lands this game for some reason. So let's go in for Grasp of Fate, just for the sake of drawing a card, and we might be able to take out Golgo this turn, depending on what we draw into. All right, going for Lightning Greaves in response to that. Because they do have the haste, so they're assuming that we're going to get rid of the Vidalcan Orrery, which I probably am. Have to go for the Shrine on Gogo side of the field. And I think Lightning Greaves here, just so I can point spot removal at Wasi Tora. And we still don't get into a land. Wow, we're not doing well on that front. Turn 10. And we've only got 6 lands. That means that we have to go for Dark Steel Mutation onto Wasi Tora in order to hold up the Strip Mine. And then we'll get rid of Maze of Ith. And then we can swing in and get rid of Go Go Batman. So yeah, maybe shouldn't have put too much stock into getting rid of the Go Lost player there. But after the All is Dust, I'm just assuming that they're going to be playing a lot of board wipes. I don't know if that's right or not. I don't really know their deck. Uh, going down to 5 mana when we're already struggling isn't necessarily the thing to do either. 
But we'll see if it pans out for us. We've got a few turns and a few hits to take thanks to our 55 life total. And the big flying commander has been dealt with for now as well. Urza's filter coming down for home. Multicoloured spells cost up to two less to cast. I've never seen that before. That's really good. Very much liking the look of Home Doggy's deck over here. Followed by Loxodon Hierarch. But deciding not to swing in, so let's see what the Jun player's got. Only three cards in hand. And they have their commander switched off at the moment. But I would think Jund would be packed full of removal. Alright, a Cauldron of Souls. Deciding not to swing in with the 3-3 Flying Cat anyway. I've never seen those tokens, they're awesome. And guess what? Still no land for us. So do we go for Estrid's Invocation onto something just to draw? I'd really like to go for Eternal Witness onto the Sigil of the Empty Throne, but it's just way too slow with this little an amount of mana. Let's go for Estrid's. Okay, an Enlightened Tutor. Um, yeah, Enlightened Tutor doesn't really help us, I don't think. We'll copy the Grasp of Fate with Estrid's Invocation. And uh, we'll just go for the Mana Rock there. And we'll go after the Exquisite Blood, just in case they've got the combo. I think we're going to have to go for Eladamri's Call onto Dryad Arbor. Yeah, as much as I hate it, I mean, I really hate this, but... We're going to have to discard at the end of the turn anyway. So we'll go for the Dryad Arbor. And play that as our land for the turn. And that leaves us with a full grip. And next turn we will have six mana again. Uh, let's go in... It doesn't matter who we go in at. Now they can block here effectively. And uh, they've got indestructible stuff over here. So we'll just hold back. So the game has really been ground to a halt by that all is dust by the looks of it. It's just a case of who can pull out from underneath it first. The 4-4 coming in at us, just offering up the trade for any one of our creatures. Not going to take them up on that, we'll go down to 51. Then it is an Aura Shard, that is not good. But luckily they're not following it up with a creature. We've gotten rid of their Vidalcan Orrery, so I don't think there's any worry about getting into said creatures during our turn. So we're definitely going to flicker the Estrid's Invocation at the beginning of our turn and get rid of that. That is the absolute last card we want to see. Especially after our Shroud has been removed. The Greater Auromancy was wrapped up in the All is Dust. Alright, the Cauldron of Souls is putting Persist on these two creatures. The token won't be affected by Persist, but this might mean that there's a board wipe incoming. The uh, the token probably won't be affected by a board wipe anyway, thanks to the dark steel plate. But it might be minus counters. Yeah, it is minus. That's decree of pain. Minus two, minus two to everything. Just doing that to get rid of their wasi Torah. So that will make the dark steel mutation fall off, and then it comes back in with persist. Uh, they don't have their lightning greaves in play because our first Grasp of Fate got rid of that. But they can put Indestructible onto it. So that is a 4-3 flyer now. And then, deciding not to swing in with anything, Grasp of Fate, or the uh, Estrid's Invocation, will trigger here. And we are going to flicker it to get rid of that Aura Shards. I think I'll get rid of my opponent's Commander as well, actually. Comes in as a copy of the Grasp of Fate again. And we'll get rid of Wasi Tora and Aura Shards, giving them back the Urza's Filter and the Exquisite Blood. So managing to get rid of the Aura Shards there, that's good. And then at the beginning of the turn, I'm going to go for Enlightened Shooter to grab the only artifact in the deck in Sol Ring. Because we can't draw into mana to save our lives, apparently. Or is it more wise to go for something like a Sylvan Library? And hope that that can make us draw into lands. Uh, I really want mana now, but... Yeah, let's go for the Sylvan Library instead. We've got the life to put into it. And we still don't draw into a land off of our two Vasa. We get Concordant Crossroads, which is in here to surprise our opponents with a huge unblockable two Vasa. 
If we can get enough enchantments down or enchanted evening, something like that. But we're nowhere near that at the moment. So we're just holding up Cyclonic Rift by the looks of it. Go in at the Jund player and put a little bit of commander damage on that. So that's four commander damage over there and we'll pass on to the Naya player. On turn 12 at this point. You wouldn't have thought so looking at the board. Now Rien is coming back down again. Yeah, I'm just going to allow the Lightning Greaves and hope that they either hold back or if they do swing in, they're going at the Jund player. I think if they're swinging in, they're coming in at us, to be honest, but... Yeah, I was in two minds about whether to Rift on the Commander there. I'd really like to keep hold of Cyclonic Rift to go for the Overload. Then the Knight of Nualara comes down. That only costs two mana, thanks to the Rock over here. And it does go in it, the Jund player, that's good. So I'm glad we allowed that. Deciding to block with the Flyer, this does not have Trample. Ooh, Balefire Dragon. Uh, they don't have Haste, so not as frightening as it would be, but still a scary card. Can pretty much wipe someone's board. And then they can give that Indestructible as well. We get round Indestructible quite nicely. I'm more worried about the Greaves and the Boots that are floating around. Okay, so now then, I'm quite happy with what's underneath this Grasp of Fate that wants to flicker. So, I'm not going to... Yeah, I'm not going to bother this time. And then we'll draw some cards off of Sylvan Library. Guess what? Still no land. Getting to Utopia Sprawl, first of all. Uh, all right, had to dig a little bit, and Sarah Sanctum, if you're going to draw into a land to get you back into it, that's the one to go for. And then we've got Dance of the Mance as well. With haste in our hand, with Concordant Crossroads, I'm going to keep all of these. Oh, and of course, we're um, going to feed Wasi Tora life with the exquisite blood, but I think in order to get us back into the game, it's worth doing. We'll go Sarah's Sanctum. That currently taps for three. Uh, we can go Utopia Sprawl onto the forest just to draw a card. Get into Smothering Tithe. Now we're getting some mana going. Name blue off of that. Now this makes them creatures if X is six or more. So if we put five into that, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, we can go... Four, five, six. Yeah, we can get a bunch of our stuff back here, actually. Yeah, I'm liking the Dance of the Mance here. So there we go. We get pretty much all the enchantments back. In fact, I think we get all the enchantments back that were put into the bin there. So we draw a bunch of cards. Uh, we've got Shroud on everything because we've got the Greater Auromancy back. We can put 10 points of Commander damage putting them up to 14 points of commander damage over there. Yeah, so let's go Journey to Nowhere. And that will make us an angel. That'll be good for blocking the Rien if we need to. And just like that, we seem to have gotten back into it. Draw even more cards, thanks to Eidolon of Blossoms being back. Journey to Nowhere onto the Balefire. Uh, so we're putting them at 16 commander at the moment. And with that exquisite blood, I think we do need to get rid of them. So let's go in at them like that. And there we go. Now we've got Calming Verse that goes with uh, Enchanted Evening, which we could grab with Idyllic Tutor. Yeah, we could go for a win next turn if we keep all of our enchantments in play and all of our mana and stuff. I'm going to hold up the Cyclonic Rift again. Even with all that card draw, we didn't get into that many more lands. We've got to get rid of six cards here. I don't think we're going to have time for Smothering Tithe, to be honest. Oh, an Austere Command destroys all enchantments. And it destroys all creatures with CMC 3 or less. That hurts. The worst thing is, it brings an Aura Shards back in as well. And we won't be able to get rid of it with Seal of Cleansing, because that would have gone down already. It also switches off our mana from Sarah's Sanctum. So we have to go Seal of Cleansing. 
And we have to punish the Naya player here, really. Uh, let's get rid of their Lightning Greaves, because paying for the Swiftfoot Boots might injure them at some point. Oh, and of course, Balefire Dragon comes back in as well. Uh, the Vidalcan Orrery comes back in, as does Aura Shard, and then there is a Lightning Greaves. And the Exquisite Blood seems to be gone. Where did that go? That's in the bin. Oh, of course, it's an enchantment, so that goes away. And they come in at us for 7 and 10. And leave back the Rien, so we'll just take the 10 here. Dark Steel Plate going straight on to the Bellfire Dragon. And they'll probably put the Greaves on there as well. A Warstorm Surge they're going for. That is, whenever a creature enters, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. Followed by Cryptolith right, only one card left in hand. And if they're going to swing in anywhere, it's probably at us. That Greaves ends up being equipped. And deciding not to swing in, so we hover at 33 for now. Alright, Ajani's chosen. It's Flyers that we're worried about at the moment. We've got a land to make for the first time in a long time at least. Maybe we have to go for Eternal Witness into... Sylvan Library, just to try and hit lands. What I'd like to do is go Idyllic Tutor and set up um, Enchanted Evening. If we go for Eternal Witness onto Dance of the Mance, it just makes everyone pile in at us. But does that matter? Uh, we take 8, 9, 10, 11, and 17... Yeah, well, we'll go Sterling Grove anyway. That helps switch on the Serra's Sanctum. It protects our enchantments a bit later on as well. If it wasn't for all this Shroud and Hexproof everywhere, we could deal with things a little bit better. So we'll just do that. We'll go for Eternal Witness onto Dance of the Mance. And continue to hold up the Cyclonic Rift. We've got a blocker at least. Voice of Resurgence, okay. We don't have any counter magic in this deck, and probably should now that I'm thinking about it. I've never played this in uh, in multiplayer before. It's a 1v1 deck. But I have edited it for multiplayer. There's obviously a little bit of work to be done yet. People have dealt with our enchantments far too easily. Aura Shards comes down, and it goes after the indestructible... Oh, maybe they don't know it's indestructible. Either way, they're not going for our Sterling Grove at least. But that Aura Shards needs to go as well. If we can make it round to our next turn, Dance of the Mance will bring out the uh, the other Shroud enchantment, the Greater Auromancy. And Greater Auromancy will give Sterling Grove Shroud. And Sterling Grove will do the same for Greater Auromancy, so literally all of our enchantments will have Shroud at that point. That just depends on whether this actually manages to uh, stay in play or not. Now it is a greater good with some big creatures in play. They probably just sacrifice this for the card draw. Yep, they are still seeing us as the threat, so coming in at us with the 7-6. And we can't block that flying dragon anyway, so we might as well just block here. And a cattle war pride. When it attacks, Create X tokens that are copies of it, and that are tapped and attacking. Where X is the number of creatures a defending player controls. Uh, they could deal a lot of damage. If they put haste on that and swing in over here, they're going to trigger the Warstorm Surge a bunch of times. Might be time for Cyclonic Rift at this point. We'll see what they do with attacks. Because it might be time to bounce that Warstorm Surge. Yep, yeah, Greaves is going over there. Then they go for Zathrid Gorgon, a 3-6 with Death Touch, 3 and tap. Put a Petrification Counter on a target creature, it gains Defender, and becomes a Colorless Artifact in addition to the other types. Activated abilities can't be activated. I don't think we have any creatures with activated abilities, but we'd rather be able to attack with things. This might be 3 damage to us again. It is... So we take six this turn. Now the Greaves going back over to the Dragon, so perhaps not 
swinging in with the Nakatl. Alright, going for the Cauldron of Souls, only targeting the um, the cat and giving it persist. Alright, and now they're going for the Greaves again, so they needed to take that off to remove the Shroud. So I assume they're going in over here and they're worried about it dying. And seeing as how they keep pointing the uh, enchantment at us, I think we're definitely going to bounce that. And uh, now they're attacking home with everything, so we're not getting attacked with anything here. Um, but I am still worried about that enchantment, so in response to the Nakatl War Pride, I'm going to bounce the enchantment so they don't throw a bunch of damage our way. That's probably why they're attacking in with everything here. Um, one to get a bunch of triggers off of the cat but two because they know that they can pile in damage with this so they don't need to attack us for the damage uh, greater good sacrifices the loxodon hierarch so they're looking for an answer here most likely they've already used the swords to plowshares right at the beginning of the game so probably going in for a path at this point so we managed to get rid of the enchantment and they discarded Smothering Tithe, Iroas, and Wrath of God. Glad to see the back of a Wrath, although it might mean that they've got one in hand still. Uh, three cat tokens come down. So they'll get a little bit of damage through here at least. Oh, and of course, I'm forgetting all about... Yeah, so the, um, the Balefire Dragon can't be blocked here because they have to block with the, um, with the War Prides. Yeah, I forgot all about that. So they have to take the six from the Balefire Dragon and one of the Nakatl tokens. So that's nine damage over there. Then six damage to all their stuff. Which will take out their commander. This puts us in a much more promising position. They decide to sacrifice their commander with the greater good. So we could trigger the land tax next turn. It's pretty much free with Sarah's Sanctum in play. So yeah, let's play the land tax. And we'll finally, by turn 15, have our land worries dealt with. Now then, Dance of the Mance. I want to put five into this so that they can't be wiped out with damnations and wraths and things like that. We want Sigil of the Empty Throne and Greater Auromancy for Shroud. Then I'll take a Grasp of Fate. And Estrid's Invocation. And we'll go with Journey to Nowhere as well. So once again, Dance of the Mance coming in handy. And we just have to copy the land tax. At the, actually, we'll copy the Sterling Grove. Just in case we're desperate for... Um, just in case we're desperate for a tutor with that. Journey to Nowhere comes down. And we will get rid of the Nakatl. And then Grasp of Fate can definitely get rid of Aura Shards. And we'll get rid of the Balefire Dragon as well. So just trying to set myself up for next turn at this point. But there might be a Bane of Progress or something over here. The good thing is that we don't have many creatures in place, so we don't look as though we can win next turn. And I think everyone's still in setup mode because we're all dealing with each other's stuff quite nicely. A Mirari's Wake coming down for home. So that is 2, 4, 6, 8 and 10. And the colourless spells cost 2 less, so with 10 cards in hand I bet they can do a whole bunch of stuff here. Luckily we've managed to keep our life total up somehow. Alright, a Dragon Brood Mother for only 4 mana. That's not bad. Swiftfoot Boots onto the Dragon Brood Mother. Knight of Nualara comes down for the 50th time this game. And there is the Voice of Resurgence again. So not showing us any new cards. They're back at pretty much the position that they were in previously. And it is 7 points of damage coming in at us from the Broodmother. Didn't have a cheap enchantment to play out unfortunately. So I'm just hoping that... The Jund player can't get out the 5 mana enchantment and then go for a big creature. I don't think they can, because they don't have all that much mana. Up comes the dragon from the Broodmother. A Phyrexian Arena. That is the last card you want to see this late in the game. Really good in the early game, but 
the longer the game goes on, the worse for Axion Arena gets. Does put their devotion to black up though, so the the uh, the artifact that cares about devotion tap for three, and they get down their Wasi Tora, which they can give indestructible, but no haste for them. So deciding not to go for the enchantment that we know is in their hand. I don't think it got discarded. Nope. We know what's in their hand. They go for the indestructible dark steel plate. And it looks as though we are free to win the game next turn. Uh, but we'll play it safe anyway. I think I think we've got it, but we'll play it safe. We'll go Sterling Grove on the stack. We'll grab three lands with the uh, land tax. Our opponent gets a dragon. So thank God that the Aura Shards is dealt with, although all of our stuff has Shroud anyway, so I don't think they could have done anything to us. Then the Sterling Grove will flicker, and we will bring it back as Grasp of Fate again, I think. Just playing it safe in case our opponents can disrupt us somehow. And just to remove Indestructible from this and make sure they don't have any permanents in play, Dark Steel Plate would survive, as would their commander after this combo. So I'm going to get rid of Indestructible there. Uh, and we will get rid of the double mana over here. Yeah, Grasp of Fate and Estrid's Invocation has been really good this game. Mesa Enchantress finally getting to another Enchantress card. Don't think we need it at this point. We go Idyllic Tutor. Go for Enchanted Evening. This will turn all the permanents in play into enchantments. Uh, that gives us an angel. And then Calming Verse is destroy all enchantments you don't control. Then if you control an untapped land, destroy all your enchantments. So we do need to uh, tap down before we cast that. Need to be careful of summoning sick Dryad Arbors with this combo. So there we go, we've definitely got all of our lands tapped down. We play the Calming Verse and that will wipe out all of our opponent's enchantments. Which is every permanent that they have in play, as you can see. Their lands are enchantments as well. Low Becker, the random, sees that. As does home. And uh, yeah, pretty much what we do there is continue to build up our board state completely unhithered because none of our opponents have any mana or permanence. We'll build up an army of angels, we'll get a Jani tokens, uh, cat tokens coming down, and over the next turn or two, we'll be able to swing in for lethal. So it's good game to my opponents. That was a real good back and forth. Uh, it was a shame that Gogo couldn't stick around for as long, but when you're running Golos and you're playing things like all is dust, uh, you kind of paint a target on your own forehead. But we'll get another game in with him uh, very soon, I'm sure. Hopefully you all enjoyed it. This is the first ever game that I've played with two Vassa in multiplayer. So, like I said, I hope you liked it. Be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe if you did. I'm Travel Kai on the EDH channel. Thank you for watching.